Okay, before we get started, we wanted to make sure that everyone had matplotlib and numpy set up. And you can check this by turning on your Python terminal and just doing import matplotlib and import numpy. Um, can you raise your hand if you haven't yet, you're not yet sure that whether you have this up? Does everyone have this? Excellent. Oh, oh, um, are you, uh, just raise your hand if you're not yet positive that you have the installation requirements yet. You don't have? That's cool. Um, all right, I'll give you a second, and if you need any help, just ask any one of us. Mm -hmm. Why don't, would someone volunteer to um, sit next to her for a minute just to make sure she gets all the way through installation? Maybe seeing if she has PIP installed? It's okay, we've all been there before. Um, do you have PIP, the package manager? Okay, great, then you should just be able to say PIP install matplotlib. All right, so just to get an understanding of everyone in the audience, can you your hand if you don't work as a programmer and you have only a little bit of programming experience, like a tutorial too? Okay, got it. So that's about a third of the room. What do you guys do? I know you, were, you work at a grant office for social science research, right? For public health? That's very cool. Um, and who else raised their hand? Oh, sorry, who else raised their hand for the first? Yes, what do you guys do? Network architecture, very cool. Um, and you manage developers, very cool. And then what about you guys? I saw some hands over here. Awesome, managing what kind of software? Nice, do you guys work together? Oh, nice. Nice. Very cool. And then what kind of programming have you guys done? Like online courses or? Very cool. Awesome. And what about you guys? Are there a couple non-programmers that raised their hands? Yes. You're a general, and you do, you do lots of programming for your work. Or, very cool. Um, what publication do you work for? That's really cool. Um, and have you worked with matplotlib? Awesome, very cool. Um, and what about you guys? Very cool. Just learning Python? You're like the perfect target audience for this. Well, at least that was my position. What about you? Sorry? You're very beginning programming. Have you done a couple tutorials before? Okay, sounds good. We'll have you partner up with people. I, I should have said that begin at the beginning. So everyone will have a partner. So just to, you can ask little questions so no one gets too far behind. And what about you? What's your experience? Awesome. Yep, that's what I did too. Sounds good. You have just enough information for this. All right, so for everyone else that is working as a programmer, can you raise your hands? Awesome. All right, so what are your experiences? Um, let's start with you.
Good, okay. Oh, okay, you should um, keep track of what you've been getting stuck on when you work on it on your own, and maybe we'll go over it over here, and if may maybe not, we can look at it at the end together. Cool. Um, and what about you guys? What's your work? Awesome. Very cool. Very cool, very cool. And what about you? Very cool. Nice. Nice. Got it. And you raised your hand as well? Yep. Very cool. Awesome. How is your installation going? Okay, sounds good. Cool. All right, so we have a good range of people from all different backgrounds here. One thing I'm going to ask is that you find a buddy, um, ideally on the other side of the technical fence as you. Um, introduce yourselves, just sit next to each other, and you guys will be each other's um, sort of teammates during, over the course of this tutorial. Cool. Oh no, you don't have a buddy. <laughs> Maybe someone that comes in. Hi, welcome. Do you want to come sit up here? Actually, we're pairing up, and we have one person without a pair. So this is your new buddy. <laughs> welcome, come on in. Yeah. Hi, I'm Renee. How are you? Owen. Co Colin? Owen. Oh, Owen. Yeah. All right, um, so we're all pairing up into buddies. Um, so I guess these guys are already. Oh, good. Perfect. Sounds good. Perfect. All right, so you guys all ready to go? All right, you guys, so I'm so glad you're getting to know your buddies well. So let's get ready to go. Um, All right, everybody, let's get started. Okay, so I'm glad we all know each other a little better. Um, we're all comfortable with each other. Um, we have a good mix of programmers, non-programmers, social scientists in the audience. And I really created this tutorial for a two-year-ago version of myself because I would have raised my hand at the first side of this, of this questionnaire. I'm currently working as a software engineer, but before, just a few years out of college, I hadn't done a lick of programming. Um, I was a very strong student in the social sciences. I went to a liberal arts college and I was an economist. And I didn't do any coding at school. My first job out of school was in, on the business side of a tech company. And so I was really interested in engineering, but to me it was this black box entirely. Um, it seemed like this magical thing that other people knew how to do that I didn't know how to do. Um, and so I started learning coding at workshops and at uh, and online courses, and eventually I got a chance to intern and become an engineer at my company. Um, and so raise your hand again if you're one of those people who is trying to learn coding at weekends, workshops, that sort of thing. Awesome, okay. Definitely know where you guys are at. And rate, keep your hand raised if you've heard advice that what you should do is to pick a side project that you're passionate about. 
Yep, definitely, definitely true. And when I got that advice, I thought that's great and I really do want to do that. But if you're setting up a website or trying to make an iPhone app, there's so much legwork you have to do before you can actually get started with the fun of coding. Um, and all the work required in getting a website out onto the internet is much more involved and requires a lot more domain, a lot more just like grandfathered in knowledge about how machines work before you get to the actual coding. Um, but the nice thing about hacking on social science questions is that you don't have to do that, right? You can write your own script, your own programs, and it's relatively self-contained. And the other benefit about that is that you're taking something that you do have domain expertise in, whether it's, whether it's geography information or whether it's economics, and you are applying a new skill that you're working on learning. Um, and, and hacking on data, like data is more widely available than ever. If you're a biology major and you want to talk about climate change or nutrition, pretty much anything that you're interested in, you can be, in, hacking on data is just one step above reading data and consuming data. You can be a more active consumer of your data um, and use information that's provided online. Great. Um, the other interesting thing is that you can answer some interesting questions that you will be naturally curious about anyway, because whatever side project you do should be something that you think is fun anyways. So raise your hand if you recognize this TED video that came out, in, I think, in 2012. Oh, shoot. Can you guys hear that? This is a very important question to get right because it was it was absolutely key for me. When our foundation first started up, it was focused on reproductive health. That was the main thing we did because I thought in a population growth in a poor country, who is the biggest problem they face? We've got to help mothers. I want to live in fancy oh. life. Oh. It's okay, it's the last one. So the more disease burden there is, the more kids they have to have to have that high probability. So there's a perfect correlation that as you improve health, within a half generation, the population growth rate goes down. In fact, Tom's rolling uh, here at this time. Okay. Did, were you guys able to hear the audio for that okay? Okay. All right, so basically um, there's this controversial question in development research as to whether you should focus on family planning with your, or whether you should focus on improving health overall and whether if you're working on improving lifespan, you're contributing to overpopulation. Um, and this was something that B Bill Gates was asked about his foundation work and something he said was that, well, actually, if you improve health, then then fertility rates go down because as people see that, that they don't need to have so many children that in order to get them to survive into adulthood, they will have fewer children within half a generation, he says. So that is something that is intriguing. Um, so it, it, uh, that's something that, you know, as consumers of information, we can just sort of take for granted, but it also means that if it's something we want to observe for ourselves, there is the data. It's an answerable question for us to be able to see for ourselves, so we'll take a tackle at, at looking at that for ourselves. All right, so, so let's think of like one question we could potentially answer. Um, this was something that interests me because I work for a telephony company, Twilio, and we wanted, and we're expanding internationally. Our customers are all over the world, um, and so let's say we want to find out one question: Who has more cell phones per capita? The exact statistic that comes from the World Bank here is mobile subscriptions per 100 people uh, between Finland and the U.S. Who do you guys? Who who, who thinks that Finland has more? Got it, and who thinks the U.S. has more? Cool, okay, so here's the data. Uh, the United States, this is from 1960 until 2012. 
United States is in red, and Finland, it looks like from the beginning, has a large lead on us. So why do we think that might be? Yeah, definitely, there's few people, richer population overall. What else? Yeah, I, I don't know about Finland, but definitely the U.S. pays really high prices for cell phone subscriptions, whereas most of the country, and most of the world, they pay a lot less. And also, where did, who, what was one of the first big cell phones that came out? Nokia, definitely, right? And that's a Finnish company. So they, like, even way in the 80s, uh, this is, way in the 80s, yeah, Finland had a noticeable number of cell phone subscriptions per capita where no one else did. Well, what about this question? Between Finland, the U.S., and El Salvador, who do you think has more? Like, compared to the U.S., do you think El Salvador has fewer or more than us? More? Who thinks more? Who thinks fewer? Very reasonable. I thought fewer, too. Um, El Salvador is a very poor country. It has a GDP per capita of about $3,500, U.S. dollars, whereas the U.S. is $46,000. And yet, the U.S. is in, or the El Salvador is in blue, the U.S. is in red, and El Salvador has more cell phone subscriptions per capita than the U.S. Uh, mind you, the U.S. started out way ahead, but El Salvador very rapidly caught up. So why, why do we think that might be? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, yeah, we found that in India as well a lot. Yeah, and also I heard that um, in a lot of countries all over the world, well, first of all, you're not necessarily tied to one plan. There's a lot more pay as you go outside the US. It's so much cheaper, and it, you can call more cheaply if you're calling like from one carrier to another phone of that carrier. So people will juggle multiple phones because if you look up here, these right now we're talking about more than 100 Subscriptions per 100 people, so plenty of people have more than one per person. All right, so today what we're all going to do together is we're going to import CSV data into, into our software with Python. Um, we're going to find a matplotlib example, the ones that I just had up there, and we're going to graph that data ourselves. Um, and yeah, so let's get started. We know that there's lots of social problems out there that we're curious about, and we also want to practice Python, so let's do it. Cool, so starting off, importing data into Python. Uh, if you go to github.com slash Renaber, that's my handle, the first project is python.socialscientists. Um, if you have Git installed, then please import that into your projects folder. If not, you can just use that for copy-paste. And just raise your hand when, when you're done or once it's, once it's downloading.
You know what, if you're having problems with your Git setup, just go to the page and just use it to copy paste into a new file of your own. Who's having trouble with Git? Just one person? Okay, oh, two people? Um, well, another thing you can do is you can just make a whole new folder. Oh yeah? Okay. Yeah, and you can also just, like, by hand, make a new folder, make new files. There's only about three files in there, so don't let it hold you back. All right, is everyone on their way to downloading that or finished? Yes? Oh, okay. So are you having problems setting up Git, or is it just in the process? <laughs> oh, OK. All right, raise your hand if you're having trouble right now. Everyone else has this? OK. OK. All right, sounds good. All right. All right. So if you look into this folder, or if you don't have Git set up, just browse on it, and you're in the interface there. Um, you should see uh, you should see a big folder that'll look like this. Where am I? Um, you'll have a data folder that has like, two CSVs in them, and then you have three code files, very basic code files. All right. And just to make sure, that what I like to do whenever I'm starting a new project is to just make sure everything works. So if you would, um, uh, go to readdata.py, that's the blank folder. Just print, print hello world in it, save that, and then run that. And you'll be able to run that by finding your project in your terminal and typing python readdata.py. Um, raise your hand if this is relatively new territory for you. Yes, definitely. OK, this is sit next to someone. This is something that you'll get really comfortable with by the end of this hour. Deb, did you get it to run? Yeah. Awesome.
All right, raise your hand when you're finished. All right, most people. All right, and you guys, you two are done? Almost? Sounds good. Did it work? Okay. All right, so I know we have a heterogeneous mix because for, for some people, finding a file, navigating the command line is you know, the most intimidating part because it's a totally new environment. And some people, that's just what you do to run your program, and it's more than an everyday thing. Um, I'm going to single out Deb just because you're going to be representative of some of our newbie programmers, or at least newbie Python Pythoners. So for, for, those of us, for those of us in the room that don't program on a daily basis, or at least not in Python, what did you just do? Yes. Oh, shoot, okay. Awesome. So you opened it with the editor, you typed in print hello world, and then you were able to type Python, read data that PY. Right, and then it said hello world. Awesome, great. Do we have any other questions for people for whom this navigation is new? Cool. All right, let's go. All right, so now we're actually going to take in our CSV. So um, you'll notice that there is a data file in there. So we're going to print in, we're going to pull in data from that. So erase your first print statement, in, um, add these steps, first import CSV, and if you're a professional programmer, bear with me here, um, or explain to the person next to you. But import CSV is bringing in the CSV library, so Python has some very basic functionality, but anything a little bit more complicated, you have to import in methods written by somebody else, so methods to help you parse a CSV file. Um, so, so this will help us bring in methods that will let us read CSVs instead of having to do all of that logic ourselves. Does that make sense? Kind of like Python lets you add and subtract, but if you wanted to do any more complicated uh, uh, functions like square roots, you have to import an additional math library. Cool. All right. The next line you'll do is CSV file equals open and in parentheses cell phones dot CSV comma RU. Um, and let me double check. I might have to. Um, can you change that to fertility.csv since I swapped out cell phones for fertility? So CSV file <laughs> equals fertility.csv since you guys have that in there. Um, and actually it's inside a data folder, so you, what you'll actually want to do equals um, import CSV, CSV file equals open data slash fertility dot CSV are you yeah no such file where am I Oh, 
Oh, yeah, I know. I'll, I'll make it smaller. Yeah, so what I'm doing is in the Python interpreter right now. I should actually be doing it in here along with you guys. All right, and then for those of you that are relatively new to programming or Python, um, opens a function, so we're just telling Python to go out there and open up this file, and we're feeding in two arguments. We say, we're, the file we want to open is fertility.csv, and we're telling Python you'll be able to find it in the data folder. And then ru means we want to read it with read-only permissions. U means universal new lines. So Mac, Windows, Linux have different ways of doing the return key, and this will neutralize it all for us. So it'll take the CSV file. Um, it's just basically data out there, and it'll give you a handler to traverse the file and save that to whatever's on the left side of the equal sign. Got it. All right. Next, reader equals CSV dot dict reader CSV file. So we made the CSV file, and now we're going to feed it in to dict reader. And what dict reader is is a class. It's basically this this once we have this idea of this thing, and we have an instance of it, we'll be able to tra traverse the file as a Python dictionary instead of literally going down line by line. Because if you look at this um, CSV for fertility, we've got all the columns here. We've got individual amounts of data for each country here. And instead of just looking at lines literally with like all these numbers with commas in between, we want to be able to look at it like a Python dictionary. And this is a Python dictionary, basically. It lets you treat the columns and the values as key value pairs that you have some context for looking at the data. Um, the first line, yes, I believe so. Yes, yeah. So you have to make sure that's at the top. This guy? Reader equals. Sure. And the last thing you'll want to do is now that we have reader, which is just basically the sucked in contents of our CSV file, now we have it. And now we want to go down and print everything that's in it. So for row in reader, print row. Sorry? It's from Python. It's the column, so it's the first line of the file. Yeah. Yes, 
I believe so. Yeah, yeah. So you'll have to do that for the World Bank data if you use it. They had a couple extra lines. Cool. All right. I hear lots of good discussion. Um, are there any questions in the audience, or did did any of the more experienced programmers get good questions from their teammates? Yeah. All right. Cool. All right. Now comes the fun part. Go ahead and run it. So go back to your terminal. You should already be in your in your folder. So now just type python readdata.py. You should be able to hit up arrow and hit return and tell us what you got. You got a dictionary? Good. Did you get a dictionary? Awesome. Lance, did you guys get it? All right, so raise your hand if you haven't gotten to the dictionary yet, if you have not gotten this output. All right, you guys all got this? Okay. Okay. Um, so, so did, raise your hand if you did get this output. Yes, we're all on the same page? Okay, let's come together now. So um, I heard some good discussion going on. Can you guys share if you had any interesting questions come up, just in case someone else had them? Did you guys have any interesting questions? Yeah, what's up? So um, with the CSV module, it's smart enough to look at the title line at the top. Uh -huh. So those are the key names. So you'll have country code, yep. years of a Yes. Yes. Yes, yes, perfect. And that's a really good question, Deb. Yeah, what's up? Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it helps to, um, to look at the data in, in Excel first so we know what we're looking at. Um, so that's a good point. Um, any other questions came up? Yeah. Yes, yes. Any other questions? Yeah, so there's two good points that came up. At first, we we're like, well, what data is this that we're looking at? So if you go to the GitHub page where this came from, here, we can actually look at the CSV data before we started manipulating it in software. So fertility.csv. Um, GitHub will let you look at this just as a spreadsheet. And this is coming from the World Bank. The World Bank collects data on so many different development indicators from you know, as big as GDP per capita to as small as how many cell phone subscriptions there are in a country. And so you can go down for every country in the world and see from 1960 on how many kids per woman, for example, each country had all the way till 2000. So when we look at it in, in dict reader format, or in dictionary format, it's basically saying, you know, instead of giving us a table, it's just saying for every table column header, what's the value? So if we look at Zimbabwe, if we looked under 2003, we would see 4.002 4 births per woman. Um, so this is a dictionary, you see it everywhere in Python, so it's just basically taking keys and values, like titles and the data. So if you were to, you know, pay for something with your credit card on a website, if the website's written in Python, then probably at some point they're sending, you know, 
name equals Renee, credit card number equals blah, and that's how data gets transferred around. Um, and the other good point that you guys brought up, that Deb brought up, was about DictReader and how it's smart enough to know like what the column name is. It's just smart enough to take the first heading from that, C that raw CSV. Um, because if you look at how the raw CSV looks, you guys see this, right? It's just like raw arbitrary data. There's nothing necessarily telling us that this is the table matching to this data. So in fact, we can try this out for ourselves. What happens if we don't use DictReader? Um, because DictReader is a more advanced class. So if you, if you just make it reader equals CSV dot reader, I believe it is. That's what it is. Yeah, so we're not using the DictReader anymore. And what do you guys think will happen if we run this version of read data? Hmm? Yeah, just super raw lines, right? Oh, shoot, what's this? Oh yeah, this is just this is just the raw. Yeah. So you'll see we have the rows here, but we don't know like what each of these data match up with. And in fact, the columns are all by their lonesome at the top. Here we have the country name, country code. But these are living by themselves. And then if we were to need to manipulate them individually, we wouldn't be able to because the lists would be completely without context as to what year each field matched. Cool. All right. Should be empty. Yeah. Yeah, we sometimes see that. Just, for, just countries fall off reporting to the World Bank. Yeah. Yeah. All right, raise your hand if you have a question. Yeah, yeah. GitHub slash Reneighbor. Just neighbor with R-E. All right, raise your hand if you have not gotten caught up up to this point for any reason. You got it? Did you get to print it everything out? Awesome. All right, I heard a really interesting question about CSV reader and classes and modules. Would you mind explaining what the question was and what the answer was? So the, the question was, it had to do with referencing Julia to the operator. Mm -hmm. So in Python, there could be multiple reader classes for different libraries. Mm -hmm. So you need to tell Python which library to look for those reader classes. Yes, because this reader is coming from CSV, which is getting imported from here. Got it. All right, are we all ready to move on? Finishing up last explanations? Yes? Cool. All right. All right, now we're going to be a little more fancy. So I enlarged the text, but you should still be able to see. For row in reader, if row bracket country name equals equals Finland, print row. And before you go off and do that, what's this saying? And ideally from someone who's still learning Python, what's this saying? Uh, yes, exactly. Nice. So ideally we'll only get one row printed out instead of all of the rows and it'll hopefully be Finland.
All right, and raise your hand when you've gotten to this. Awesome. Nice. Great. All right. Any questions so far? All right, so what are some things we observe about what's getting spit back out at us? Like, if we, you know, were just completely new to programming, didn't know what dictionaries were, like, what are some things we see about this data? Yes. Yes, it's not sorted. So that's probably something we'd have to fix if we wanted to do something with this. What else? Hmm? We would want to visualize it, yeah. So right now it's just text. It's not doing us a whole lot of good. What else? Um, well, what about some of you guys that are programmers? Like if we wanted to start piping this into a graphing library, like what is another thing that's problematic about the form that this data is in? Yes. 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 Yeah, so those are the three main barriers. It's not sorted. The numbers are strings, and so that means that like, they're interpreted as pure text because when CSV reader comes in, it'll suck in everything, and it doesn't know whether 1.76 is like, meant to be interpreted as a number that can be sorted and added or divided. All it knows is that it's text, and so by default, it'll treat it as text. So we're going to have to turn it into a decimal number. Awesome. Awesome. Is anybody stuck? Need someone? Okay. All right. Is everybody ready to move on? Please raise your hand if you're ready to move on. Yes, what's up? Oh. Yes, yes. Do you mind explaining? I'll pull up the example here. Yes. That they're equivalent to each other. Yes. Yeah. So what? So what would happen if we made this a single equals? Let's see here. Error. Invalid syntax. Yeah. Got it. All right. Raise your hand if you're ready to move on. Ready? Awesome. Are you guys getting stuck on something? Okay. Sounds good. What's up? All of them? Did you save? Mm. Lance, did you have a question? Okay. What's up? The CSV file itself is just data, and the reader library turned it into, into lists, into like a pointer, a file, a pointer traversing a file. So it's just taking every row and treating it as a list. Yes. The, the Here at this point, it's just a pointer. So it's just, it, you'll just call, um, you'll just iterate over, well, you'll just have to treat it, you know, suck it into a class, which will treat it as actually a file that you can look at. Um, but here it's just a pointer in memory, and here it's data, and then. Yours isn't saving for some reason? That's really strange. It's the same file name, same. OK. 
Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. Hopefully, it'll change in the next edits we make. If not, you can look on with someone else or someone. All right. So, the next thing we want to do is we want to make an interesting visualization. And as every good coder knows, the best way to create something is to copy something that someone else has written. So we'll go to matplotlib, which is the standard graphing library in Python. Raise your hands if you've used matplotlib before. Yeah, OK, about five or six people. Um, and we'll want to, well, first, the first thing we want to do is think about what we want to graph, right? We have, we have countries over years, and we just want to see what kinds of vis interesting visualizations we can make. So the most standard one we want to do is like over the years pick a country and say like how fertility has gone up or down over time, right? And what kind of graph is that? A line graph. Yeah, a line graph. Um, I picked a bar graph because I want to compare two, but a line graph would also work and you could also do that. Um, so I went to the gallery, um, which you can go to at matplotlib slash gallery. And I found this guy. And I thought, yes, you're the one for me. So if you go to that, let's see. So if you look at the code for this, don't worry if you, none of this is familiar to you. But they, they're, they give you basic graphs. They give you so many different types, which is why matplotlib is, and Python is favored amongst the scientific community. Um, but even if we don't know anything about how matplotlib works, we can still look at this code and get a small idea for how it works. So we see this bar graph. We know that the first half, more or less, is drawing rectangles, right? We saw these rects equals ax dot bar. Um, and we see that, like, th these are men's and women's scores. And we see that these men's means, this series of numbers, is correlating to these bars, right? 20, 35, 20, 35. So that's where the data is coming from. And women's means, same thing, right? Down here, 25, 32, 25, 32, okay? And the second half is doing all the labeling. So if we just, like, just focus on just that, we can sort of start to figure out what we know and what we don't know. Um, the first thing that I like to do when I'm finding something to copy is just run the raw example as it is, just to make sure if it works. So if you will, go ahead and in your read data, just copy and paste everything from matplotlib and run it in Python. And raise your hand if you get that. Oh, uh, no, just copy and read data, since that's our working file for now. Yeah. Hmm? I just copied this from the gallery. Oh, yeah, so to clarify, go to matplotlib um, slash gallery. There's the bar chart demo on it. Find that and copy the sample code for this exact same thing straight from online into the file you're working in. Yeah, just go ahead and delete that. Yes. Did you guys get it? Awesome. Sorry, did you get it? Oh, okay. Yeah? Great. You got a different chart? Oh, so you picked a different chart. All right, raise your hand if you have a question.
All right, so from here, if I was just working at home by myself and I was trying to make a visualization for this presentation, I would just start reading the code, looking at methods where I didn't know them, and start deleting stuff until I had a program of entirely things that I understood. So that is already there for you in basicchart.py, which is basically like I stripped down everything from this example into just the basics needed to draw a bar graph. So if you close out read data and open basicchart.py, this is what we're looking at. So, um, so it's the same thing and it's got a lot of labeling taken out. So now go into your terminal and run python basic chart.py. And, and something that you'll learn fast is that matplotlib's really annoying. In order to rerun a program, you have to manually click out of this window before you can run it again. I don't know. Is anyone using IPython in this room? Yeah? Nice. Into a different window. Cool. Like a plugin or Nice. Great. Raise your hand if you got the basic chart to show up. Nice. Good. Yes. Oh, um, oh, get clone that Python programming for social scientists. Take. If you want, you can um, copy and paste the files. Just make a new folder, make a data folder, and then copy and paste. Yeah, yeah, yeah in, your, in your own filing system. Yeah. Are you guys stuck on something? No. Okay, cool. All right, are we all ready to move on? Great. Okay, so now we, you know, we had this hypothesis that the series of data is where the raw values for the bar charts are coming from, but let's you know, make sure that that's true. So in Finland data, we have 50, that's lining up for 50. Change that to you know, whatever number you want and run it again. Oh, changing one of the values of Finland data here. Yeah, move it around. You can change this to like 20. You modified the values? Awesome. All right, raise your hand if you're ready to move on. Yes. Oh, 
Oh, it used to be 40? It just changes to anything. The po Oh, here? Sorry, which one? Oh, it's just an arbitrary value. This is just, this is eventually we're going to pipe in real data, but right now it's just hard-coded data that's being fed into the bar graph. All right. All right, all right, let's come together now. Did everyone, was everyone able to modify the graph a little bit? Yes? All right. Yeah, if you want, um, if you wouldn't mind just looking on with someone for now and then you can go back to GitHub and redo this again later. Or maybe during the break. Yeah, yeah, or during the break. Yeah. Hmm? It's GitHub slash Renebr. All right, let's come together again, you guys. So. All right. So right now we have a bar chart that has just the values for Finland, but we also want to compare how two different countries do in fertility, right? And so that, those come from here, Rex El Salvador and Rex USA. So go ahead and uncomment these and uncomment the lines. And ax.bar, I'll go ahead and tell you what the function does. It says this is how you draw a series of bar graphs. The first argument is the leftmost corners of each of the, um, of each of the graphs. And so it, you'll feed it an array of values, which comes from, which comes from this range of, like, the length of each one of the data. Um, the second one is the actual raw data, and the third argument is the width. So uncomment this, but in order to um, have data for El Salvador or for the USA, we'll also need a series of data up here for those countries. So go ahead and just copy and paste Finland data and make yourself an El Salvador data and a USA data and change the values so it doesn't look exactly the same if you want. And raise your hand when you've gotten this bar chart with three countries. You got it? Good. All right, raise your hand if you have a question. Yeah, what's up? The index? Yeah, the index is the position of each graph, and so you actually give it an array of numbers, I think it is. And so here, numpy.a range Finland data, 
is just basically going to tell us one, two, three, four, five, and that'll tell us position the, the different bar graphs at this. And so you'll see that for the subsequent ones, and this is why I had this pre-baked and commented it out, you do some arithmetic to figure out, okay, if the first one is at one, two, three, four, five, the next one has to be at 1.35, 2.35, 4.35. Yeah. Do you have a question? Oh, okay. What's up? Oh. Sorry. Um, I was just wondering with the uh, add or take a add subplot thing. Yes, the one 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 I think is the positioning of add subplot. Let's look it up. Actually, why don't you look it up together and then tell yeah, us in a second? I was looking it up and I was like, Yeah. Did you get yours to start changing? Oh, shoot. Um, not really, yeah. Yeah, 515A would be your best bet. Yes. Anyone else have a question? Cool, okay. Did everyone, raise your hand if you didn't get the three bar graphs. Great, all right, let's keep going. So, um, okay, so now we have, you know, the basic thing that we came here for. We have this visualization, we have a beautiful bar graph with three things of hard-coded data. Um, and so now the task is the, the big $64,000 question. We want to take our CSV data that we have spinning out into the console of fertility, and we want to take our matplotlib graph that's able to take, you know, hard-coded in integers, and we want to put them together so that the matplotlib graph is actually giving us something interesting, right? So going back to the Finland data that we had before, um, can someone that wasn't a programmer, like, tell us what needs to happen to make this look a little bit more like this? Because basically we want to take the value from the values from this and pipe it into here, right? So what are some things that need to happen? Sort Definitely sort them. What else? Uh, yep. So re yeah. Recast them. Nice. Nice. And the other things we will want to do, oh, does anyone else have ideas for what needs to happen to extract the data? What? Oh, okay. Yes, yes, because right now we have a dictionary of the keys and values, so we want to strip out the years and only feed in the data, but in sorted by years order. Um, and the other thing is right now we have like the indicator name and the country name, but what we want is for it to just purely be data of the year numbers. We don't want Finland, we, we, like if we added Finland, in here, oh, in here, that would mess up our data, right? So we want to make sure that the values that we're sending to matplotlib is only the raw numbers. Um, and the other thing we want to do is if there's any blanks, turn those into zeros because that's how we would want to represent that in the chart for now. So if they're blanks because they haven't reported to the World Bank, like, um, and it wasn't Angola, it was another country, um, we want to make sure those are just blanks on the bar graph. All right, so, um, so let's get to work doing that. So if you go to, yeah, yeah, there's some that are zeros and there's some that are blank strings. Um, like Finland has a couple that are blank strings. Um, so I believe that means that they just hadn't reported, the World Bank doesn't have data for that year. Um, but that will give us an error if we try to feed null to matplotlib. So if it's blank, then we want to turn it into zero. Got it. Um, so open up the second chart, or the third one we're going to read, which is chartdata.csv. And this is almost the same thing as basic chart.py. Um, let's see here. So if we look at basic chart, see all it's doing is it's taking the same data plot.add subplot plot.show, 
but I packaged it up into a main function and we have this extract data that you guys will fill in. So when Python runs, it's going to say, oh, what do I do? I don't do anything yet here. I don't do anything yet here. Oh, main. I have to run main. What's main? That's basically what had been, you know, the reading the CSV, drawing it. But what's happening here is instead of if the country name equals equals Finland, instead of printing row, we're going to extract data. And extract data is the cleaning up function that we're going to do to take that you know, that dictionary of Finland's data, strip out country name, turn it into integers, and return it into a cleaned up version of, of that data so that we can send it to matplotlib. And what I'd like for you guys to do is to turn it into a dictionary that's just years um, and into integers, and instead of feeding it a list, we will eventually feed it finlanddata.values, like, like this which will let us take a dictionary and only look at the values, not the keys. Cool. Um, so why don't we take 10 minutes, work with your buddy. For those of you that know programming, this will be really, really simple and easy for you. For those of you that don't, it's sort of throwing you in the water. So just take 10 minutes, with, work with your buddy, and sort of talk through how to do this. And I'll wander around. and and see how you guys are doing.
everybody. Can you wrap up what the last thing you're working on? Even if you didn't get to it, that's fine. We'll get all to it together. Okay, so remember, so are you ready to regroup? Yes? All right, so remember the three things we wanted to be able to do are, one, we wanted to sort the data. We wanted to turn strings into ints for the values. And we wanted to, what was it that we had to do besides that? Oh yeah, get rid of like country names. Oh yeah, yeah, thanks. Cool, all right, so the basic thing that extract data will have to do are these three things. So um, what order would we want to do this in? I guess, well I guess it doesn't matter. Sorting would probably happen last, even though it's the most obvious. All right, so raise your hand if you got it to get rid of names, indicator names. Awesome. So how, uh, raise your hand if you didn't get it to get rid of names. The names like country name, indicator name. Okay, so can you show me, and right now I have it just running here, what would you do in my function to get rid of the name? Yes, yes. The length. Oops. Oh, because the years are, okay. Got it. Got it. We just care about years, yeah. That makes sense. That is, that is a really good idea. What's one potential problem that could come up from inspecting the length of the key? If there's a space, definitely. What else is a potential thing that could, yeah. Yeah, strip out, yeah, strip out. So strip out the values and if the length is four. Um, but, I'll, but I'll ask you, like, is what, if you're implementing this in your day job, like what's one thing that you would point out in code review if, if you're using length? That's true. Yeah, into an integer. Yes. Yeah, that's the one that I would go with too. Did everyone understand what he said? Did you guys understand what he said? We've got the two non-programmer team. What he said about coercing the years into integers and. Oh, okay. All right. All right, so, oh, okay. All right, so did, you, did everyone else, did anyone have questions on what he said about how we would make sure that we only have the years in there? All right, do you mind repeating in like non-programmer speak what you mean? Okay. Yep.
Yeah, so, so what Deb was asking is, instead of 2003, instead of these being years, what would happen if one of the, instead of indicator, there was some sort of ID field or something like that? Like, you know, the ID of this chart, and it was a, it was a number, so we're not looking at years. Um, so that's one potential problem um, that could happen if we're looking for the, them being just integers, like, if we're only looking at the keys being four digits and just being integers, um, that doesn't necessarily keep out anything that's not a year, um, but for this data set, it works. What's one way we could make sure that we're only capturing years as we parse this row? What's one thing that we could do? Check, like, bet make sure that the value is what? One thousand, no, nineteen hundred. Yeah, exactly. That's what I did too in my version. Um, so, putting all that, so you can make sure that the key is between nineteen hundred and two thousand fourteen, for example. So if you have those two things, that it's an integer and that it's in that range, and the way that you say that in Python is in range 1960 to 2014, then you know that you're dealing with years. Awesome. ID could also be in that range, I guess so. So I guess... Oh yeah, that's what we're trying to do, is we're trying to f filter non-years. Using an exception? Oh, I see. So say we know that we're looking at indicator name, country name, and if it's not in those, filter that out. That's a good strategy, too. That, that's really interesting. Yeah, it depends on what we mean by safest, because if it's a new CSV file that has... Yes, yeah, yeah, got it. All right, yeah, definitely. So that is another strategy. Um, any other questions? Okay, so let's, so now that we have that, so that's how we would get rid of anything that's not um, names. And how would we turn strings into floats for the values? Well, actually, before we go, can you help me program up here your strategy for only looking at years? Yes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Is this key dot strip here? Okay. Mm -hmm. And then the next line, I put, I set the value, I do, I created a new, a new value, a new uh, variable called the value. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so first we make a new value, so we're only looking at something that has four digits. Okay. If. So first we're looking at if everything is four digits long, 
then make this, and then we'll reassign it to new value. So it's just holds the zero, so if you have an empty string, it's a value. Ah, so that's how we make sure that we don't have any blanks. Got it. Awesome. Yes. All right, let's see how this looks. Oops. Is printing? Print data? Am I printing data? Oh. Hmm. Where am I printing? Oh, we need to assign it. Oh, yeah, but it's a blank for me right now, so I need to. Uh, oh, yeah, I'm sorry, yeah. We need to get in that password. This guy? Yeah, for this guy. Data. Let's see, data key is new value. Oh, I'm running the wrong one. All right, so now we have years and values, years and values. Awesome. And it's sorted for us. Yes. Or no, it's not sorted. Wait. 19. Yes. 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 All right. Yes. Yes. So did anyone get to sorting the dictionary by key? You did? Awesome. How would I, how would I do that? Yes. Awesome. What did you Google? Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. All right. And you got it to work? Yeah. All right. Can you tell me, how did you get yours to sort? Oh yeah, from collections. Yeah, so, so I import collections and then uh, import. I, I got, yeah, import collections and then I did uh, the ordered row equals. Ordered row. Yeah, I, I created everything from the collections. Mm -hmm. so ordered ordered dicts. Yeah. Awesome. And then what did you do down here? Oh, sorry. Like this? It's is it a new dictionary? Uh, no, it's uh, gonna it's gonna be collections. Dot oh. Uh, ordered dicks. Got it. And then open parentheses. Uh, sorted. And then open. And then row dot item. Oh. Okay. Uh huh. It was already in order. Yeah. Interesting. This is different from what I did. So, if you would print this here, it would already be in order even before you started stripping out stuff. So here, it's already 1960, 1962, blah blah blah, and then 
everything that's not a number is at the end. That's a really interesting strategy. Okay. And then what did you do? For key value in ordered row dot iter items, okay. And then, uh, then I just did an if else thing. So if the length of the key was greater than four, then I passed. Ah, uh, yeah. Else, if the value was was an empty string, then I. Sorry, I was I was getting <laughs> It, it probably still works for this, right? Let's see, did it work here? Yeah, we've got, wait, wait let's see here, 19. Oh, this is data, so let's see here. For key value, why is this not in order here? Oh yeah, because data is not necessarily ordered. So, so we'd want to use this at the end. Was did yours end up in order at the end? Yes. But I, I kind of did the whole for loop differently. Yeah, the for loop Okay. So yeah, the version that I did, I sorted at the end. But that yeah. All right. But that's cool. All right. So. We, we can cut to uh, what I have at the end right now. Let's see here. <laughs> no, don't say darn. We're good. So, in fact, why don't we do this together? So, we've, we, why don't we, we're going to use this. This was a very useful thing. So, you've got data here. Ordered row equals, instead of, instead of sorted row, we're sorting data dot items, I believe. So, what will this give us? Ordered row ordered dictionary of these guys. All right, what does this give us? Oh, return. Let's see. All right. Let's see if this. Oh, yeah. This one? Oh, no, we don't. All right, what does this give us? 1960, good, all right. So there we go, we have the years in order, we have them in integers, and we stripped out all the names. Great, so between your guys' two things, we have them to work. All right, Whew, that's a lot. Raise your hand if you have a question. Uh, <laughs> what's one thing that was like totally out of the blue? For you, the sorting, yes. Okay. S okay. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, sorting dictionaries. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because because dictionaries like are so, such a big part of dictionaries that they're not ordered in order to save memory. Um, you have to like import this entire other library just to be able to do it. And you add, you see the ordered row, and then you like pass it in the key that that you want to sort it by. Cool. Yeah, yeah. The shorter answer is Google copy and paste and tinker until it works. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 
You know, it looks like they're there, but they're blank. No, those are two questions. Two. Hmm. Yes. The last eight are plotted as zero. Let's see. Two thousand twelve. Yeah, the last two are and let's see. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's something it'll have to take more time to figure out why there's so many. Yeah. Okay. So now we have these bar graphs just for Finland. And we want to add other countries, right? And we want to feed other countries through that same extract data function. So what would we do if we wanted to add like the United States and El Salvador? Here? Where? No, 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 you're, you got it. Yeah, so tell me what I would want to do. So you know, for early in the leader, I would add an, a two other H Yes. Like here? And then I would just change these to the countries, right? Yes. Cool. All right. Oh, yeah. Like this? Nice. And then we change this to El Salvador data and USA data. All right, and with that, oops, I'll have to change. Change Saudi Arabia to El Salvador here. Rects El Salvador. All right, so you just basically had to copy and paste the same, like, we're traversing the entire file. If the field name, if the country name is one of the countries we care about, also extract the data and then when we uncommented this, we're passing the extracted data into matplotlib again. Cool. All right, so run that and raise your hand if you get a bar chart with three different graphs. Ooh. Down here?
You guys got it? Great. All right. Great. So raise your hand if you were able to get the graphs with three different countries. Ooh, where? What line is the air on? Something like you're on here? Did you, um, are you only looking at years? Hmm. Can I see? New value. Key strips four and you got zero. Float value. Value value. If the length of the key is greater than wait, wait, if the length of the key of this should be value here. Because right now, this is looking at as long as the value is greater than zero, like as long as it's actual filled in. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. So raise your hand if you have a question. All right. Raise your hand if you have the three bar graphs drawn up now. Yes? You guys still figuring stuff out? Okay. Hey, how are you guys?
Are you ready to regroup? No? Okay, we're going to go back to open working right now, but just pay attention to me for just a second. Raise your hand if you're able to get indicators to show up. Yes? So some of you are still having trouble? <laughs> Sorry, were you able to get yours up? Okay, okay. All right, for those of you that, did, were, that were able to get the indicators up, the last part, we have 20 minutes left, is go to the World Bank Indicators table um, and pick your own. Or if you already know of a CSV of data that you would like to look at, go ahead and do that. And just ask a question. And I'd recommend first sketching out the kind of draft, the graph you have in your mind first, and then like using what we know to draw a graph. And at the end, I'll ask everyone here to teach us something. So go pick another indicator and find a correlation or some sort of relationship you want to draw. And if you want to be really advanced, like this lady in the front, what you can do is you can try to alter matplotlib itself. She, I think she is going to try to alter the bar graph. Um, but I'll set a timer for 10 minutes. Take your time. And if you don't get to the end, that's fine. If you want to just get, get caught up, that's fine too. Um, and one thing you'll want to know is when you get to the World Bank indicators, um, the first two lines that they have on their CSVs are blank, and so that'll mess up the dict reader. So delete those two first lines and then run it. If you have any questions, I'll be circling around. But yeah, I'm going to set the timer for 10 minutes. We'll regroup at 12.10 and be prepared to teach us something. Sound good? Cool. Did you have a question? Yeah. Oh, uh-huh. Oh, you want to, okay, I was going to see if he, if I could help him first and I'll circle around. <laughs>